Hi everyone, welcome to This Week in Space Science. And guess who we have with us? You're right, it's Dr. Sean Cruzen from the Coca-Cola Space Science Center here at Columbus State University. We are always grateful to have Sean. Sean, welcome to your show. Thanks, Mike. It's good to be here. Uh, glad to be back. We took a little, little bit of a hiatus here, but now we're back on track and we're going we're gonna to keep you up to date with what's going on in outer space. Well, I love to hear about those kind of things. And I know you, you always bring in a list. We've got some great photos for us, uh, our viewers to look at today. And so uh, I'm anxious to get started. So, all right, so what's our first story? Well, you know, something interesting, uh, there's a Cassini spacecraft has been out uh, in, in the vicinity of the planet Saturn for a number of years now, and it's returning a lot of very interesting data back and very beautiful pictures of Saturn, uh, the ring system, some of the moons that are nearby, some very interesting stuff that it's discovered. Uh, but right now, one of the things that it's sent back pictures of is something kind of unusual. It turns out that there are these uh, many multicolored kind of splotches all over the surface of several of Saturn's moons, and it almost looks like some of these moons are having kind of a paintball fight. So there's this big paintball fight that appears to be taking place among Saturn's moons. Now you might think, well, what, what are we really talking about? It's not paintball, right. obviously. Yeah. Sounds like so, some meteors coming in there or something. Sounds like some meteors coming in, exactly. Something coming in from space impacting these lunar surfaces. But then once the impact takes place, these, the, the splatters, if you will, are very colorful in nature. And it looks like what's happening is that one of the moons, and it's a moon called Enceladus, one of the moons has these jets that are shoot out uh, material from the southern pole. And so they're, they're almost like a geyser uh, that, that comes shooting material out of the southern pole. And, and when, when that material gets shot out, it, it, it's chunks of ice, and it's in the, in the way, in the, in the path of the orbits of some of the other moons. And, of course, these other moons will then run into th those, these ice chunks, and when they hit, they make these colorful splatters all over the surface of, the, of, of these planets. Now, one of these planets is called Rhea, and we have a picture of uh, Rhea, and we can show you some of the... Some of the it's kind of the coloring that you see on the surface. And here we're seeing a, a photograph from, uh, from the Cassini spacecraft. You get those kind of colors that you see kind of splattered all over the surface. And that's, that's due to these ices that have shot out of, the, of these geysers from the, the moon Enceladus. Now, some of the other moons that are taking part in this kind of paintball match are Mimas, Enceladus, uh, Tethys, Dione, and of course Rhea. And, and, uh, and, there, and actually Mimas, we've got another photograph we can show you. Mimas has this kind of weird shape that some of the scientists have now become to, to call the Pac-Man feature. And you can see why it kind of looks like a Pac-Man. Oh, <laughs> you yeah, can see this see photograph that. here. It yeah, almost looks like a Pac-Man eating part of the planet. Well, this, this photograph that you're seeing now, it's actually a thermograph image. This right. is a, a temperature map taken in the infrared, uh, also by the Cassini spacecraft. But it shows a temperature difference over one side of Mimas compared to the other. And, but it's got this really unusual shape. And they think that this temperature difference may also have to do with this uh, kind of paintball fight going on, some of these collisions with ice particles being shot out of uh, the, the planet Enceladus, or sh I should say the moon Enceladus in right, orbit so, around the planet. So uh, the picture down in the uh, bottom left there, mm -hmm. if you noticed, uh, I mean, that, that's an actual photograph without it the, is. Uh, the thermal imagery. And, and you might have noticed there's a big feature on that thing. There's a big crater. Now, that's, that was made a long time ago. That was from a very, very large impact. Uh, and you see that huge crater there on the surface of that moon. Uh, that's certainly not part of this whole kind of ice ball fight that's taking place now. That, was, that would have been a much, much bigger impactor from longer time ago. Right. right. Uh, so, so these things that we're are shooting out now, they're much softer. Uh, because of the ice, they're much lower density. They're not going to make the same kind of impact pock marks that you saw in those photographs. But they are going to splatter those uh, different chemicals over the surface, which cause that different color. And you see a lot of pinks and blues, as it turns out, in this whole cosmic paintball fight uh, that the, the Cassini spacecraft has photographed uh, around the moons of the planet Saturn. Well, it, it really is interesting that the colors are out there in that way. And, and I was thinking if it's thermal energy uh, or imagery, then what we're talking about is the, the yellow, the red, all of those are hotter colors. And so the blue on that image is uh, rather interesting. It, it, it looks, now, is that, does that have anything to do with the way that it's... Uh, face toward the sun or, or anything it, like that? It, it does, and, and, and you're right. You're, what we're showing you is two different kinds of photographs. Some of those are actual visible light photographs you would see with your eye. You'd see these, uh, th these different colors on the surface. But then the Pac-Man photograph we showed you a minute ago, that is a thermal image, and so that's, there's a temperature scale associated with that. So the, the colors you're seeing there uh, correspond to the different temperatures that are being recorded by that thermal camera. And certainly it does have... Uh, uh, dependence on the way that that moon is oriented relative to the sun. The sun's going to obviously 
warm it up and cool it down. But what you're seeing there is uh, th that those temperature differences that make the Pac-Man feature are not necessarily associated with how that moon is, is oriented relative to the sun. It really is some kind of a difference in the, in the surface chemistry that's going on that's causing that weird shape on that one side in the thermal images. And that's probably due to some kind of an impact where there's actually a different material over one part of that moon. And so it has a different uh, temperature characteristic. And, and you're right, the, the, the scale that's shown there on, on the right-hand side of that picture, you see the yellow at the top, blue at the bottom. That's right. showing you the differences in temperature, blue being colder, that yellow being hotter. And you can see Pac-Man himself is more kind of in the orange region, whereas the rest of the surface of that moon is very, very cold. It's down in that bluer part of the region of that temperature scale. You know, it seems to me that this spacecraft has uh, been out there for quite a while now. So how much longer is it, is it expected to do? Is it going past uh, Saturn or where? what's this it, trajectory? Now? It is. It's in orbit around the planet Saturn right now. So, and in its orbit changes, the, they're, they're able to still steer the Cassini spacecraft so they can pull it a little farther away or a little closer to it. They can fly it a little bit closer to some of the moons as it makes passbys. But basically it's in an orbit around the planet Saturn. And, and, and you're right, they didn't know how long it would last. And any time you send a, a probe out into the hostile environment of space, you never really know how long that probe will survive. Cassini has certainly been a successful probe in the fact that it's still sending back data from the planet Saturn, and it could go indefinitely. You know, this, this spacecraft is charged uh, by the light from the sun, so it charges up on, on solar panels. And, and as long as they can keep that uh, spacecraft charging successfully, that mission will continue on out there around the planet Saturn. Okay, that sounds good. Now, um... I'm interested to hear more about something about a new planet. Do we have a new, have we discovered a new planet? <laughs> there, was a, there was a planet discovered recently, and the interesting part about this is the planet that was discovered was very, very Earth-like, and it was a planet called uh, Glyssa uh, 581b. Okay, Actually, I, Sean, sorry, I, I don't know if I'm going to remember that, <laughs> but I'm going to write that down so I've got it. Though. Go ahead. Glyssa 581G, which means there wasn't A, B, C, D, E, and F in the same system. So, so Glyssa 581 is the name of that star. That's the red ball you see in this photograph that you're seeing on the screen now. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a much smaller star than our sun, much more red in color, which actually means it's cooler, not hotter. In this case, it's a cooler star than our sun. Right. But Glyssa 581G, the reason it's special is because it was living in a very special region of that, of that other solar system, that exo, extra solar solar system. Uh, it, the region that they, that they uh, kind of nicknamed is, is a Goldilocks region, which means it makes that planet not too hot, not too cold, but rather just right, a just right temperature for the possibility of this weird stuff called liquid water to exist. And if liquid water can exist, which only exists over a very narrow range of temperatures and pressures, then there's a possibility that life might actually exist on this planet. So, so okay. Glyssa 581 being the star, the planet that they found that's very Earth-like in size is also in the habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone, where liquid water might exist, and that's the planet G, the G in that system. And, and so it makes it a very, very interesting planet, Glyssa, Glyssa 581 G, which it could be that it may harbor the right conditions for life to exist. All right, so it's right in this range, and I assume that there's some way to measure... Uh, the type of uh, atmosphere or, or the type of, uh, the, the, I don't know about the environment, but maybe the, the chemistry of, of those planets and puts it in that range. Is that right? Is that it, it, well, exactly. And, and, and so to figure out whether or not it's in that Goldilocks zone, that's simply just a matter of distance from the star and how hot the star is. So it's strictly a, a function of temperature. So as long as they know, as long as they can figure out the orbital radius, in other words, how far it is from that star and how much energy or heat that star is putting out, they can figure out whether or not the right uh, conditions would exist on the surface for liquid water to exist. So this, star, this planet does have those characteristics. They also are able to figure out the planet's mass, and from that they can kind of figure out the size of the planet. And this one looks like it might be relatively close to the size of the planet Earth. So two, two very interesting possibilities that make it Earth-like. Now, obviously, like you said, they want to know the surface chemistry. They want to know what's in the atmosphere. That will be the next, uh, the next batch of studies. So now they know it's there, and now they know that it's in this very special position. They'll go back with much, much larger telescopes and try to, try to get observations of that, that very specific planet to see if they can pull out data about the atmosphere or any kind of surface chemistry on the surface. They do this technique called spectroscopy, where they ah, let the light shine it. through uh, something that's kind of like a prism. They break the light into the, the rainbow spectrum of colors. Okay. And within that spectrum, they try to 
pull out the signatures of various chemicals, and they can kind of figure out what's right. in the atmosphere or what's on the surface from that kind of an observation. Well, great. I, I, I wasn't sure exactly how to talk about that, but I think you hit it on the head there of where I was going. All right, now, there has to be uh, something in here about Virgin Airlines, Virgin uh, Space. Uh, you know who we're talking about. You know, one of my favorite characters of all time in real life is this guy named Richard Branson. There you go. Richard I Branson, knew we'd come into conversation I, I mean, somehow. He's, he's just know? cool, let's face it. He's cooler than me, all right? So <laughs> it's just easy to say. Because he has his own airline company, yes. Virgin Airlines. He has his own record company, Virgin Records. He has his own space company. That's what I know. And, and you know, if you're going to have an, a company, you might as well have a space company, you know, that's what I'm saying. So <laughs> he is, he's actually, his company, Virgin Galactic, is actually on the forefront of this new industry of space tourism. And they're working with a group called Scale Composites, uh, who, who's a, a spacecraft designer, to develop the spaceship that they, they are calling Spaceship Two. Now, obviously, if there was a Spaceship Two, there was a Spaceship One. So right. Spaceship One was the first private spaceship to actually take a human being into space. Uh, so, so somebody other than NASA or Russia or China taking a human being out into space, that was done by Scale Composites working with Virgin Galactic with Spaceship One. What you're seeing a photograph of here right now, this is Spaceship Two, and the interesting thing about Spaceship Two, there's two interesting things about it. Number one, it's designed to take multiple people into outer space, actually crews of passengers into outer space. And the other thing that's very interesting is it made its first successful solo flight very recently. So th this spacecraft is designed to be carried underneath the belly of a larger spacecraft, which is called the White Knight. And the White Knight will carry it up into a high altitude, like just like a big airliner, just like a big jet, carrying this spaceship on the bottom of it. And when they get up to a high altitude of flight, they will drop what you're seeing now is Spaceship Two. They'll drop it off, and Spaceship Two then has its own engines, which are capable then of, of blasting off and launching Spaceship Two up into a, an altitude that is considered outer space. And that's a little bit more than 60 miles above the surface of the Earth. So Spaceship Two does not have the capability of orbiting the Earth or, or being, being able to carry people safely into an orbital altitude and orbit the Earth multiple times. It kind of is a one-trick pony. It flies up really high gets people up to an altitude which is considered to be outer space, and then brings them back down and, and safely lands them on a runway. Right. So the test that was just recently done that was successful was Spaceship Two riding under the underbelly of, of the White Knight, dropping off and then gliding. They call it a glide test. It, gl right. it glided down safely and was able to land on the runway out there in New I th Mexico. I think we have a picture of that one as well, you know. And these, these really are great photos. Uh, but there's, there's a neat separation photograph. You can kind of see Spaceship Two in its, in its flight. It's separating out from underneath the White Knight. And you can really see that the White Knight is a much, much larger aircraft uh, carrying Spaceship Two underneath it. And, uh, and of course, once the separation happens, they've got to get a safe distance away from each other. The little spaceship has to drop off away from the big airplane. Uh, the lovely shot right there of them separating. And, and when, that, when, they're, when they achieve a, a, a safe distance away from each other, that's when the smaller Spaceship Two will hit those rocket engines that will carry it the rest of the way up to this altitude, which is considered to be outer space. Okay, in outer space, how long are they there? How long is They're that only there for a few minutes, and so they'll, they'll, hit that, they'll hit those big thrusters, they'll lift that craft off to this high altitude, they'll, they'll go up and experience uh, uh, the, the feeling of being outer space above the atmosphere, they'll actually be able to see the stars, they'll see, it, see the curvature of the Earth, uh, they may experience a little bit of weightlessness as they're coming, coming over on a parabolic arch, but then they'll drop back down, and they'll actually come back to the, to the space center in New Mexico, very much like an aircraft would land on a runway, very much like an aircraft would. So, oh, amazing. That, that is uh, truly fantastic. Now, now, you can buy your tickets today, Mike. It's you know, I've been, I've been thinking about it. I've been saving, uh, but, uh, you know, I hope the piggy very... bank's big that you've been saving it in, because uh, yes, these, these flights are a mere $200,000. Oh, Okay. So, so per, right. seat. And, and per, seat. Really, yeah, per, per seat. Per seat. Per every seat. And I'm not really sure if that includes the baggage charge okay. or, or the yes. destination fee. I, was, I don't really I, know if the, <laughs> the destination fee of being outer space, that might be kind of a stiff one. Well, I, I don't really curious. know if it includes that. But $200,000 and you could fly to space with Richard, Grant, Richard Branson and the, uh, the crew from Virgin Galactic. All right. I've got some more saving to do, Sean, before I can, I'm ready <laughs> for that. All right. Now, on another story, I know NASA has, was in the news. You know, we've talked a lot about the change and and space flight being closed down and a number of things going on with NASA. So there's got to be some news about what's going on there in NASA. Well, you know, the, NASA is, is pushing toward a privatization of space flight, of human space flight at least. Uh, they're hoping companies like Richard Branson's and other private companies, uh, Elon Musk, 
uh, being one of right. those. Uh, his company, uh, SpaceX, which is Space Exploration Systems. People know Elon Musk because he was the developer of this thing called PayPal right. uh, on the Internet. Right. But anyway, he, he's got some spare change. And so he's investing that in his own space company. And, and, and so the direction of NASA is to take, uh, take human spaceflight into the realm where these private uh, contractors are, are doing the actual building of rockets and launching them and taking people into outer space. And so right. NASA has, uh, they've caught a little bit of heat over that uh, from various factions who, who don't necessarily believe that that's the right way to go with, with NASA, with the, the, the future of human space exploration. Right. This includes, of course, many famous astronauts like Neil Armstrong and, uh, and, and others from the Apollo era who've come out and said that they don't really agree that this is the right way to go. Now, on the other hand, Buzz Aldrin says, yes, it is. Right. So you have a lot of, a lot of controversy going on. Well, yeah, I'm thinking Buzz Aldrin, who's talking about Mars, right? Buzz, point, Buzz Aldrin really thinks that private moon. space companies should be used to, t to transport human beings out to the planet Mars and that instead of the moon, should really be our next destination in space. I'm with Buzz. And so, and so these are interesting ideas. But, but obviously, Charles Bolden, who is the uh, director of NASA, Right, the we NASA certainly have talked about him over a period of time. Exactly. Now. Because of these issues and other issues, there's, he's been in a little bit of a, a hot seat, a position of controversy. And, and just recently now, the next headline with Bolden is that he, he's been in a new controversy because he's going over to China to discuss with China a cooperation on human spaceflight with the Chinese aerospace industry and their, and their space program. And, uh, and there have been many people who have come out now saying, hey, is China really who we want to be collaborating with? Right. You know, or, or is the Chinese space program really the ones that we want to be working with? Because uh, obviously China has some, they have some problems politically and internally, uh, issues over uh, uh, human rights record and things like that. And so there are a lot of people who just think we should not really be working with China uh, and bringing them into the fold on, on projects like the International Space Station and, and, and our future of human spaceflight. Right. Uh, we're already working with Russia in that regards, and there's, there's critics over that too, but we have been. Uh, and, and the future of after the shuttle program closes down, our future plan is to allow the Russians to carry our astronauts back and forth to the International Space Station until private spaceflight is achieved in the United States and we can hitch our own ride with private companies. And so... So Charles Bolden over this week talking to the Chinese, and, uh, and again, uh, there's some senators and congresspeople who are out saying, really a bad timing, shouldn't be talking to the Chinese, and, and Charles Bolden is under pressure again from, from both sides. So Wow, he, always some controversy, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and I would say because of NASA's new direction, which is really not set by Bolden, but by, by the administration, uh, right. I would say that Bolden has been one of the most uh, controversial figures in charge of NASA, at least in recent times, and so... So he's really been in the news a lot for controversy and, uh, and, and is again this week. Wow, isn't that something? All right, so also at NASA, we talked about, uh, as you came in earlier, uh, the Kennedy Space Center. Some things are going on there. Tell us about that. Well, you know, the Space Shuttle uh, Endeavor is actually sitting out there on the launch pad. It's ready for its, uh, it's getting ready for its early November launch. That's right. And so it's so a lovely site, one that people won't, probably won't see too many more times, a space shuttle at Kennedy Space Center sitting out there on the launch pad. So who shows up to get a picture taken with the, with the space shuttle? Well, it's the Transformers. Of course. Of Why course they I are. think of that? Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. So the Transformers are out there. Actually, uh, they're, they're, uh, th this would be Optimus Prime and Bumblebee. I actually know the okay. Transformers. Okay, all right, right, there you go. So that uh, says they're, something right there, <laughs> but that's, uh, it's great you know them. They're sitting out there near the launch pad of Kennedy Space Center so they can get some video, uh, get some footage, because obviously they're going to use the space shuttle at least as a backdrop for the upcoming Transformers movie. Oh, so, I can see it now. The space shuttle transforms into I, one of those uh, Transformers. I would be very surprised if the shuttle didn't transform into some kind of space-age robot in the future coming <laughs> Transformers 3. With All right. So I, video for us. We, yeah, can, we can look to, forward to a shuttle Transformer in the near well, future. Well, see, I'm I just predicting these things, but uh, you never know where those movies are going to go, though. But yeah. that's nice to have it out there for the kids and the families to come in. I think that's great. It really is. It's kind of a neat thing, and it helps, it helps NASA with their PR efforts as well. Gets, that, gets the images out there in the space shuttle so that NASA gets a little PR out of the deal as well. Well, Sean, thing. you've really given us a lot of news today, but I, I have to ask you, closer to home, what about Coca-Cola Space Science Center? I know you've always got so many great things going on, and I assume that astronomy nights are going to be back into play now, too. We are, well. We're getting into a new season of astronomy nights, and, and you're right, we have... All kinds of crazy things always happening at the Space Science Center. We try to keep the pot stirred at all times exactly. for the Space Science Center, keeping interesting things going. Our next astronomy night, as you mentioned, actually it's this Saturday. It's uh, October the 16th. It's going to be at the Space Science Center. We're going to be downtown in our downtown location. Okay. That program is going to start at 7 o'clock. You can go into the Omnisphere Theater 
and get a tour of the virtual nighttime sky with Dr. Rosa Williams. That part of the program will happen rain or shine. That is free of charge at 7 p.m. And then after that, if the sky is clear, we'll take the telescopes up out on the south lawn, set them up out there, give you a beautiful view of the moon and also the planet Jupiter, which is in a prime location to be observed right now uh, in, the, in the eastern sky right after sunset, planet Jupiter hanging around up there, be able to show you some of its moons and some of the stripes across the face of that planet. Very nice sight. Oh, that sounds great. It's, it's going to be a great program. Also, the very next Saturday, October the 23rd, we're going to be in, uh, doing a collaborative program with Oxbow Meadows Environmental Learning Center. Oh, yeah. Out there Oxbow. on Lumpkin Road. Yeah, Oxbow Meadows, oh, our, you our know, sister institution well, here. Well, they're, they're wonderful out there, just like you guys are. And I'll tell you what, they're building. Uh, there's a new building out there, a lot of construction, but they have some wonderful things coming up. They're absolutely trying to push their center forward and try to think of new creative programs to have. And the, and the program they're going to have on the 23rd is called Tricks, Treats, Tricks, Treats, and Trails. <laughs> tricks, that's treats, and trails. That's a mouthful right there. Yeah, Sean, well, I, I have trouble with these T words, obviously, <laughs> like transformers. Anyway, tricks, <laughs> treats, and trails out at Oxbow Meadows on the 23rd of October. Uh, they're going to do all kinds of carnival-type activities and have lots of fun uh, games and activities for the kids. And also they're going to do a bird release. They're actually going to release some owls back into the wild that have been rehabilitated oh, okay. by the Raptor Center over at Auburn University. So Raptor that's kind of Center, thing. yeah, and Auburn's coming. All right, that's So Auburn good. will be down to do that bird release, and those birds hopefully will live there then in the environment near Oxbow Meadows. And, and then nice. after that, uh, at about 7 o'clock, the moon will be rising, big full moon rising on yes. October 23rd. Oh. We'll be there with our telescopes. We'll be looking at the moon and showing folks the moon as it rises over in the eastern part of the sky. And also we'll probably be shooting for the planet Jupiter then as well, starting about 7 p.m. So, so that okay. activity actually starts at 5, okay. goes through about 8 p.m. in the evening. It's a $5 charge per person, uh, a discounted price for kids. You can get on their website and find okay. out all the details for, for Oxbow Meadows. But, uh, but just know that we're going to be out there with our telescopes and uh, having a good time with the folks from Oxford. Oh, that's a, that's a great combination of two great centers coming together and helping families and kids come out there and get into nature and also see some stars as well and take a look at that planet Jupiter. I think that's great. great All right, so what else is going on? Uh, well, another thing that we have going on, uh, we, uh, there's, a, there's a comet in the sky. A comet? A comet in the sky. And actually, when, there's almost always a comet in the sky somewhere. Right. Yeah, but like, this one happens to be bright enough to be visible with backyard telescopes may even get to visible uh, to be bright enough to be visible with the naked eye okay. around the 20th of October. Now on that day this comet called Comet Hartley 2 and okay. comets get their names because of the people that discovered them. So there's right. a guy named Hartley who discovered this comet and it's the second one. So it's Comet Hartley 2. Uh, comet Hartley 2 will make its closest approach by the Earth on about October 20th and as it does that the crew at the Space Science Center is going to have our big telescope right. focused on that comet we have a video camera that we can hook up to that and send live feed right out to our website. So we'll be doing a Excellent. video stream of Comet Hartley 2 on the night of October the 20th. And so people can get on our website and, and tune in for that video stream, that live shot. If you don't have a telescope yourself or you just don't know where to look and see it yourself, you can see it on our video stream on October 20th. Uh, you'll be able to email questions into us and ask us questions about the comet. Uh, we'll, we'll post our answers up for you. And so a live, interactive webcast from the Mead Observatory at the Coca-Cola Space Science Center. If you want to know the address... Yes, I'm dying to hear the address of that. It's, it's, it's right here. Oh, right there here. it is. It's, it's www.ccssc.org. Charlie, Charlie, Sam, Sam, Charlie.org. Get on that website. There will be a link right on the front page for that webcast on the, on the 20th of October to see Comet Hartley 2. All right, excellent. And we also have a phone number there, too, as well. Call the phone call. number, the info line. That will give you all the information about everything that's taking place in our show schedule and all that stuff at the Space Science Center, 649-1470, with a 706 on the front of that. 706-649-1470 gets you the info line at the Space Science Center. Go call the Space Science Center. All right, I love it. Now, there's one more thing. I, I don't know if we touched on this. There's something about laser fright light. Well, you know, Mike. I don't know about this. So it we is October. This? Okay, it's getting a little and spooky for it's me. Getting, I don't it's know. toward the end of the month. We like to get a little spooky, apparently, around that Halloween time. And uh, we do have our lasers still up and functioning for the moment, at least. At oh, the that's Coca-Cola right. We, did, we talked about that earlier. Our that's laser's right. been up and down. It's kind of an old <laughs> one. That's true. We have to give it a little CPR now and then, but right now it's working. You can check out the schedule for Laser Fright Light, which is our Halloween show running in the Omnisphere Theater. Uh, it's a great show to bring the kids down and, and all kinds of fun Halloween music and some fun graphics up there on the dome and take part in in one of our shows. Now, if you don't, if you can't make that one or if our laser happens to be not working at the moment, we will run another great show for you in the Omnisphere Theater. A couple of the other ones we have running in the month of October, we have a great show called Invaders of Mars. 
It's invaders not, of Mars. It's Wait not invaders minute. from Mars. Oh, okay. It's invaders of Mars. Oh, turns okay, out, okay. Turns out that human beings are the invaders of Mars. We've sent all kinds of probes up there to is investigate it? the planet Mars. And, and is that the way? Really, yeah. <laughs> it is the way, it turns out. <laughs> uh, really take a close look and a good study of the planet Mars. And so this show, Running in the Omnisphere, Invaders of Mars, is all about those uh, great Mars missions and what we've learned from them and, and what we expect from Mars uh, exploration in the future. So a really neat show in the Omnisphere. Now, if you don't make that one, another one you might want to check out is called yes. Seven Wonders. Okay. And Seven Wonders, running through the month of October, another great feature film, talks all about the seven wonders of the ancient world and also goes through the seven wonders of outer space. And it's narrated by Sean Bean, who was in that great movie National Treasure, among other movies. I guess he was in the Lord of the Rings series as well. And right. so Sean Bean, a great actor, does a great job narrating that show, talks all about the seven wonders of the ancient world, which I find particularly interesting, and also talks about seven wonders of outer space, shows some beautiful space imagery. Come down and either see Invaders of Mars or Seven Wonders or Laser Fright Light or one of our other many great shows that we have running in the Omnisphere Theater at the Coca-Cola Space Science Center. Sean, I can't thank you enough for uh, bringing all that to our attention. And it just sounds like there's so many wonderful things going on down there. You've, we've got to get out. So we want to invite all of our viewers and folks here. Our, bring your families. Bring your kids. Uh, come yourself. I mean, go to Coca-Cola Space Science Center. We've given you the information there. Sean, thank you again for another wonderful show. We can't wait for the next show. We hope you uh, enjoy our show as well. Tune in to coehp.tv here at Columbus State University in the College of, Health, the College of Education and Health Professions. I'm Michael Baltimore along with Sean Cruzen. Thank you for watching This Week in Space Science. Thank you, Mike.